so in the previous videos of quantum mechanics uh, we have seen how the Bohr semi-classical model is applied to the hydrogen atom okay uh, so this video includes the analysis of the hydrogen atom with the full quantum mechanical model uh, so the reason the hydrogen atom is used is because it's the simplest atom, so it contains just a single electron. Uh, but the analysis can be extended to single electron ions such as helium and lithium. And also the hydrogen atom is convenient when doing experiments to test a theory. Um, and another reason is that the quantum numbers used to specify the allowed state of hydrogen can be used to describe the allowed states in more complex atoms. Uh, so when Schrodinger applied his wave equation to the hydrogen atom, he found that quantization appears naturally due to the requirement that a certain uh, spatial function is finite and is single valued. Uh, so in the previous video of quantum mechanics, we have seen how the Bohr model overcame the problem in Rutherford uh, model uh, of electrons falling into the nucleus uh, and emitting a continuous spectrum of radiation. Uh, so uh, the atom continuously loses energy and decays. So uh, Bohr uh, solved this by applying Planck's ideas of quantized energy levels to the electrons in the atom. And he showed that the electrons in the atom are generally confined to stable orbits, non-radiating orbits, known as stationary states. Uh, and Bohr also used Einstein's concept of the photon to find an expression for the frequency of radiation emitted when the atom makes a transition from one stationary state to the other. Uh, but Bohr's model was not able to explain the more subtle uh, spectral details, such as, for example, the discovery that the lines of the Balmer and other series are not single lines, instead it consists of closely spaced lines. Uh, and also, Bohr's model was not able to explain, for example, why some single spectral lines were split into three closely spaced lines when atoms were placed in a strong magnetic field. Um, so one of the concepts that were introduced to resolve this issue is that the electron has an intrinsic angular momentum known as spin. Uh, so the hydrogen atom consists of a proton and an electron. So for convenience, um, it is assumed that the proton is stationary and that the electron is moving in its vicinity but is prevented from escaping the atom by the proton's electric field. Uh, so Schrodinger equation in Cartesian coordinates is written in this form, okay? Um, so the electric potential energy of the proton-electron system uh, for the hydrogen atom is minus e square over 4 pi epsilon naught r. And due to the symmetry of the atom, it is more convenient to use the spherical uh, coordinates r, theta, and phi rather than the Cartesian coordinates, okay? Uh, so this is Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom where we substitute uh, for the potential energy and we use the spherical coordinates, okay? Uh, so, from the previous video of quantum mechanics, it is shown that uh, the conditions that uh, Psi must obey uh, are, for example, being normalized and also that Psi uh, and its derivatives be continuous and single-valued at each point. Uh, so, when solving this equation, it turns out that three quantum numbers are required to describe the electron in a hydrogen atom, okay? instead of just the single quantum number in Bohr's model. And this is because in Bohr's model, the only quantity that varies for the electron is its position from the nucleus. And only one quantum number specifies the state of the electron, analogous to how only one quantum number is enough to specify the state of a particle in a one-dimensional box. Uh, but for a particle in a three-dimensional box, uh, three quantum numbers are needed because there are three sets of boundary conditions that the wave function must obey in each of the x, y, and z directions. Uh, 
Uh, so a hydrogen atom is analogous to a particle in a 3D box where the electron's motion is restricted by the electric field of the nucleus instead of the walls of the box. Uh, so the electron is free to move in three dimensions within the restriction of the electric potential and so there are three sets of boundary conditions in each direction, okay? So this equation can be used using the separation of variables. Uh, so um, R here uh, describes how the wave function psi of the electron varies along the radius vector from the nucleus when theta and phi are kept constant. Uh, and the function uh, theta here describes how psi varies with the zenith angle when R and phi are kept constant, okay? And the function here phi describes how psi varies with the azimuth uh, angle phi when theta and r are kept constants. Uh, so then this leads to three equations here for each of uh, uh, phi, uh, theta, and r. Uh, so as you can see, this partial derivative is transferred to uh, these uh, three ordinary differential equations uh, for each separate function of a single, var single variable, okay? And only the equation for the function r depends on the potential u. Uh, so this is the solution of the first equation, okay? So since uh, psi must have a single value at a given point in space, then this function at a certain angle must be equal to the function at the same point, which is the angle plus 2 pi, okay? So this can happen only if uh, ml, this constant, is equal uh, to these values, okay? Uh, and this is known as the magnetic quantum number. So the solution for the second equation exists provided that the constant L is an integer equal to or greater than the absolute value of ML. So this condition is expressed in this way, which means that ML can have a, a maximum value of L, okay? So the constant uh, L here is known as the orbital quantum number. Uh, so the solution for the third equation requires that E be positive or have one of these negative values, okay? And this uh, negative uh, sign shows that the electron is bound to the atom, okay? Uh, so this formula uh, is the same formula obtained by Bohr's hydrogen model. And another condition that must be obeyed is that the principal quantum number n uh, this one must be equal to or greater than L plus 1, okay? And uh, this is expressed in this way. So, so the maximum value of L is N minus 1. Uh, so note here how these quantum numbers naturally appear in quantum mechanical theories of particles trapped in a particular region of space. Uh, and this is due to the fact uh, that for the wave function associated with the particle to not have destructive interference with itself um, around, for example, a loop, then we need to have an integral number of the Broglie wavelengths to fit into the loop. Uh, because if we have a fractional number of wavelengths uh, around the loop, then the uh, wave cannot persist because destructive interference will occur, okay? Uh, and so this is why the uh, wave function psi must obey certain boundary conditions. Uh, so knowing now the quantum numbers, uh, the equation for psi can be written in this way. And the table here shows the normalized wave functions of the hydrogen atom for n equal 1, um, 2, and 3. Uh, so, uh, the, in the quantum theory of the hydrogen atom, the electron energy may have any positive value corresponding to an ionized atom, okay? And it can only have certain negative values given by this equation. And so this principal quantum number here, uh, as you can see, describes the quantization of the electron energy in the hydrogen atom. Uh, and the orbital quantum number L describes the quantization of the angular momentum, okay? Uh, 
so from this equation here, you can see that the total energy E, it includes the, uh, the kinetic energy uh, due to the radial motion, which is the electron uh, motion uh, towards or away from the nucleus. And it includes the, um, uh, the orbital kinetic energy due to its motion around the nucleus and uh, plus the potential energy, okay? So if we substitute uh, for E here, we get this equation. Uh, so uh, since uh, this is uh, the equation that depends on a single, va a single variable, which is um, R, uh, this means that the last two terms here, they cancel each other out. So we equate them. And we know that the orbital kinetic energy is half m v orbital square, and it is related to the angular momentum um, as L equal m v orbital r. So it means uh, it is equal to L square over 2 m r square. So we equate these two, and this shows that the angular momentum uh, is, quant is quantized. Uh, so this shows that the electron can have only these particular angular momenta, okay? And so like the total energy, the angular momentum of the electron is both quantized and conserved, okay? Um, and the macroscopic motion, such as, for example, planetary motion, in which the angular momentum is conserved, the quantum number describing the angular momentum is so large that the separation between the discrete angular momentum states cannot be absorbed. Uh, also, the states are specified as letters according to this scheme, okay? So as you can see that an S state has no angular momentum and the P state where L is equal to 1 has an angular momentum of square root of 2h bar and the D state has an angular momentum of square root of 6h bar and so on, okay? Uh, and also to specify a certain atomic electron state, uh, the total quantum number is combined with the letter that specifies the orbital angular momentum in this way, okay? So for n is equal to 1, we have just the 1s state. For n equal 2, we have 2s and 2p and so on. Uh, so the orbital quantum number L determines the magnitude L of the vector uh, L, the, ang the electron's angular momentum vector L, okay? And from mechanics, we know that L is perpendicular to the plane in which the rotational motion takes place, and its sense is given by the right-hand rule, as in this figure. Uh, so the electron revolves around the nucleus in this tiny current loop, so it generates its own magnetic field due to this motion, okay? Like that of a magnetic dipole. And so an atomic electron that has angular momentum will interact with an external magnetic field B. Uh, so the magnetic quantum number ML uh, specifies the direction of L by determining the component of L in the magnetic field direction. So that component is LZ. Uh, so we assume that the uh, direction of the external magnetic field is along the Z direction. So in that case, the component of the total angular momentum L in the Z direction, LZ, is equal to ML H bar. And so the values of ML as you can see, it range from plus L to minus L. And so the number of possible orientations uh, of the uh, angular momentum vector L uh, of the electron in an external magnetic field is equal to 2L plus 1. Uh, so this figure shows the space quantization of the orbital angular momentum for L equal 2. Uh, so there are 2L plus 1, so 5 possible values of ML. So each value of ML represents a different orientation relative to the z-axis. So a different orientation relative to the external magnetic field. Uh, so this shows that if an external magnetic field is applied along a certain direction, then the total angular momentum of the electron uh, cannot have any direction with respect to that field, but only specific directions, and this is why it is known as space quantization. Uh, 
uh, and note here that the vector L can never be aligned exactly parallel or anti-parallel to the external magnetic field B um, because the value of LZ here is always smaller than the magnitude of the total angular momentum. Uh, so this shows that only one component of L is quantized and also the magnitude of the total angular momentum is also quantized, okay? Uh, and if there isn't any external magnetic field, then the direction of Z is arbitrary and the component of L in any direction we choose and name Z would be ML H bar. Uh, but an external magnetic field provides a reference direction that is experimentally meaningful or observed, okay? So we will now see uh, how the fact that only one component of the angular momentum is quantized is related to the uncertainty principle. Uh, and this is because the total angular momentum L can never point in any specific direction, so instead it is somewhere on a cone in space, okay? Uh, such that uh, its projection LZ is equal to MLH. Uh, because if that wasn't the case, then it would violate the uncertainty principle. Because suppose that L is fixed in uh, direction, so it is fixed in space, um, this would mean that LX, uh, LY, and LZ have definite values. Uh, and this would mean that the electron would be confined to a specific plane, for example, the xy plane, and the total angular momentum is in the z direction, okay? But if the electron is in uh, the xy plane all the time, then this also means that the electron's uh, momentum component, pz, in the z direction is infinitely uncertain. Uh, and this is because delta z in this case uh, is certain approaching zero. Uh, and this is not possible if the electron would be part of the hydrogen atom. Uh, so its momentum cannot be infinitely uncertain in the z direction. Um, but because only one component of L, which is uh, we name Lz, has definite values and also the magnitude of L has definite values where the magnitude of L is greater than LZ, then this means that the electron is not confined to a single plane. Uh, and so there is an uncertainty in the electron Z coordinate, okay? And so the direction of L here, the total angular momentum, is not fixed but is somewhere on a cone in space. Uh, and so the average values of Lx and Ly are zero, but Lz always has a specific value of mlh bar. Uh, and also there is the spin angular momentum of the electron, uh, the quantization of its magnitude and the quantization of its Z component. And we'll include this in a later video. So thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and see you in the next video.